Mathura. You know the pastime of Krishna leaving Mathura? It's really nice. All of his pastimes are nice. The way that it's described as Rukmini. Rukmini was Krishna's first wife in Dwarka. So um, Krishna arranged some pastimes for his marriage to Rukmini the son of Bhishmaka. So, the daughter, excuse me. So, when Krishna killed Kamsa, we'll get to chapter 8 in a minute, just telling Krishna stories. When um, Krishna left Vrindavan, he went by invitation to Mathura. Kamsa invited, sent to Kura to come and bring him to Mathura. So they could have, he could take part in a festival. It was called the Bow Festival. It was a big, giant, giant, giant bow. Similar, not the same, but similar to Ram's Leela where he broke the bow of Lord Shiva. It was a big, celestial bow. It was a bow festival. So Krishna went, even before the festival happened, picked up the bow and broke it. Strung it and broke it. Um, then the wrestlers of Kamsa and Krishna killed Kamsa. So when Krishna killed Kamsa, he had two wives. And the two wives were daughters of Jarasandha. There's a story of how that happened, but I won't go back that far. They were, it was arranged marriage. Jarasandha gave his two daughters to Kamsa. So the daughters went back to their father, Daddy, what happened? Krishna killed our husband. Oh, Krishna killed Kamsa. I'll take a vow. I will kill Krishna. He got a huge army and went to attack Krishna. Krishna smiled, went out onto the battlefield alone. Didn't even take Balaram, didn't take his army, just went on the battlefield alone. And alone he wiped out the entire army of Jarasandha, leaving one person. Jarasandha, he told you, you can go home now. And he was so embarrassed. He's a chachra, he's a great hero, and he's like defeated. So he was decided to give up his life, and his minister said, no, no, it's just one of those things, you weren't ready, and... Get your army together and go again. He said, yeah, I'll get another army. So, so many 20-something times, armies, and Krishna destroyed all the armies. He thought it was a great plan because he appeared in the world to kill demoniac kings, and he could. Jarasandha's bringing all these demoniac kings for him to kill. Fantastic. And they, they got liberation. So, he uh, stayed in Mathura, but he got some inkling that the father of Rukmini wanted to marry Rukmini to, of all people, you know who was supposed to be the marriage to? Shishupal. No way. So, Krishna made some arrangements. The arrangement was Jarasandha made an alliance, there's the whole story of how this happened, with another king up to the north named Kalyavana. He was a king of the Yavanas. It's a long story. And so they, they sent a text message to each other and decided, you'll send your troops and I'll send my troops and we'll converge on Mathura and finish Krishna once and for all. This is like the 23rd time he came. So Krishna turned to Balaram and said, this could be very dangerous for the residents of Mathura. You hold off the armies. I'm going to take the entire Yadu clan to not yet built Dwarka, because it's one of the eternal abodes of Krishna and connected to the royal family. 
although it was in the sea. So Vishwakarma built the city. Krishna transferred the entire Yadu dynasty, made personal arrangements for all of them for accommodations, and came back to Mathura. Balaram had held everybody off. And Krishna went onto the battlefield alone. And Kalyavana started charging him. So what did Krishna do? He ran. Now Krishna's not afraid, but he had another plan. And his plan was for this wonderful king named Muchakunda to get a chance to do some service. So he ran into the cave of Muchakunda, and Kalyavana was trying to reach him, but he was always just out of reach just to keep him going, to chasing him. Chased him into the cave. Kalyavana saw somebody sleeping. He thought, oh, he's just pooped out. He's taking rest. He kicked him. Get up. But it was Muchakunda, it wasn't Krishna. And Muchakunda had a benediction from the demigods. That's another long story. That he could sleep uninterruptedly and anybody woke him with his eyes, their body would turn to ashes. Kalyavana was cindered right before the eyes of Krishna. So Muchakunda woke up. He saw Krishna, who are you? Krishna told him who he was. Oh, it was foretold by Gargamuni that I would see you face to face and now I'm seeing you how greatly fortunate I am, and so forth. Krishna went back to the battlefield. He ran from Jarasandha. Twice, same battle. And Jarasandha calling, you coward, come back. Krishna and Balaram went up a mountain, and Jarasandha thought, I'll just burn the mountain, and then I'll kill Krishna that way. So Krishna and Balaram jumped, and on the way, they went to Balaram married Revati and Krishna married Rukmini. So all of that was to say, Vrindavan is Krishna's eternal place, Matra is Krishna's eternal place, and Dwarka is Krishna's eternal place. All of that was just to say that. And Krishna performed worldly pastimes that are reflections of or likenesses of his pastimes in the spiritual world, Krishna Loka. No Jarasandhas and no Kamsas and no demons, but pastimes, eternal pastimes. So Nanda just saw that they're eternally there. And so now we're back to chapter 8, the glories of Nanda and Jasoda. The, the, a, a big feature in chapter 8 is the pastime of Krishna showing Mother Jasoda inside his mouth because the other cowherd boys had said Krishna had eaten dirt. And Krishna said, they're liars. I didn't eat dirt. And Mother Jasoda said, why would they lie? They're not enemies, they're your friends. And there's your brother. Your elder brother isn't going to make up a story like this. She said, if you don't believe me, look inside my mouth. So she did, and she saw the entire universe. Now, how could the entire universe is big? How could the entire universe fit inside that small boy's body? Well, the answer is everything is within Krishna. It's not three-dimensional space, that's everything that's within Krishna, but everything is within Krishna because everything because he is the source of everything. So anything that exists, the universe and beyond the universe, it's within Krishna. So she saw that. Not only she saw that, she also saw herself looking inside Krishna's mouth, inside Krishna's mouth. Whoa. She started to process, what, what, what is this? She considered, maybe it's just a dream. And then she considered, no, it's not a dream. I'm, I'm wide awake. And then she considered, maybe it's an illusion created by the demigods, Deva Maya. 
And then she ruled that out, saying, no, I'm not so important. Why would the demigods bother creating some illusory thing for me? And then she considered, maybe I'm just deranged. Maybe I've just gone mad. And ruled that out. No, I'm, my faculties are quite normal. Everything's all right. Then her fourth consideration was, Gargamuni said, Nanda said that Gargamuni said at the name giving, Namakarana ceremony, that Krishna would have powers like Narayan. So maybe this is one of those. It's Narayan's powers showing something. And then she, her mood went to offering prayers to Narayan. Oh, Narayan, you're the supreme, you're this, you're that, the other thing. Please protect my son because she's motherly affection. And then she started going into this like detachment space saying, he's not my son and Nanda's not my husband and I'm not the queen ruling over the, the kingdom of Vrindavan with all the cows and all the... I'm just a servant of Narayan. And again, her mood of wishing Narayan to be protective of her son. Commentary says, Krishna covered her with his yoga maya potency so she would f just completely forget what she saw. He may be whatever he may be. He can't be anything divine. When, when I'm not there, he cries. And he's always hungry. And he's naughty and... This isn't the Supreme Lord or someone. It's just, any, in any case, he's my son and that's it. She, got, she became peaceful. And Shukadeva Goswami is narrating all this and says, her love and the love of Nanda Maharaj is so exalted. The Vedas teach this about God and that about God and different levels of God realization. But Mother Jasoda, she's beyond even the Vedas. She just sees Krishna as her son. She's the most exalted person anywhere, beyond any yogi or brahmana or anybody, anything. She's, she's most elevated. So Prikshit, hearing this ecstatic mood of Shukadev, says... What austerities did they do in their previous lives to get this position with such love? And then the second thing is more of a, a declaration. They're more fortunate even than Vasudeva and Devaki because Vasudeva and Devaki became the parents. Krishna was born as their son. But they didn't even experience the childhood pastimes of Krishna. And Nanda and Jasoda were immersed in them with such Incredible love. So then Shukadeva replies by describing in, a, in an interesting and a little puzzling way about these two personalities, Drona and Dara. Have you heard their names before? Somewhere? Drona, it's described, is a partial expansion of the eternal Nanda in Krishna Loka. The Supreme Lord made this request, expand yourself in a form that can reside in the heavenly planets. That's Drona. Yasoda, you expand yourself in his counterpart, his wife. So her name was Dara. And they lived, they were, he was, Drona was in the, um, Same position as Grandfather Bhishma. What's the term? Vasus. He was a Vasu. He was a chief of the Vasus. And he, Drona and Dara, prayed to Lord Brahma. And the prayer was, we are childless. We're re making this appeal to you please arrange that we can take birth, that, that the personality of Godhead can become our son. He smiled and said, very well, so be it. 
when it's time for Krishna's appearance, you appear on earth first, and um, you can then become the parents of the personality of Godhead, and he'll perform his pastimes. So the Acharyas explain, it's not directly in the Bhagavatam verse, but from other Puranas, they entered into the body of Nanda and Yashoda, because when Krishna appears, his whole entourage comes with him. They appeared. Rona entered into the body of Nanda. And Dara entered into the body of Yashoda. So there was two entities, or so to speak, within Nanda and Yashoda, experiencing Krishna's childhood pastimes. So that's narrated by Shukadeva Goswami in the towards the end of chapter eight, and it's an answer, his answer to what did they do in their previous lives. And in the course of all this there's lots of back and forth that they their their fortune being even greater than Vasudeva and Devaki, in part because their love was natural. They didn't undergo anything. In the worldly pastime, we know that Vasudeva and Devaki, when Krishna made his appearances, Vasudeva Krishna, the forearm form, with symbols of Vishnu, his hand, and everything, Vasudeva Krishna said, I have appeared as your son for the three consecutive lifetimes. In Satya Yuga, you were Suttapa and Prishni. You underwent long austerities with the desire to have a son like me. So I appeared before you in the same form. And I said, you please me very much. Not only I will come as your son, but three lifetimes. So he came as Prishni Garba in Satya Yuga. Prishni Garba, the son of Prishni and Suttapa. And then the next yoga, Treta Yuga, he appeared as the son of Kashyapa and Aditi, Vamana, Vamana. And then this time, Vasudeva Krishna, son of Vasudeva and Devaki, in Dwarpa Yuga. But right after he was born, he left. Krishna requested for safety's sake, because Kamsas may try to come and kill me, take me to the side of Nanda and Jasoda and place me there. There's a female child, bring the female child back. And we'll trick Kamsa this way. So that's what happened. So now we're going to go to the, the final section of chapter 8, where the special glory of um, Vasudeva and Devaki are narrated. So, if you ha you want to look up the verse, it's ten eight fifty one. And I'm going to read from commentary from Krishna Sandarbha. Krishna Sandarbha is a writing of Jiva Goswami describing Krishna Tattva. The elderly cowherd men and the gopas, that's the cowherd boys, of Vrindavan also felt intense parental love for Lord Krishna must be gopis, coward men and women. This is confirmed in the following verse of Srimad Bhagavatam 10.8.51. Translation, Therefore, O Maharaj Parikshit, best of the Bharatas, when the Supreme Personality of God had became the son of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, they maintained continuous, unswerving devotional service in parental affection. And in their association, the other inhabitants of Vrindavan, 
the gopas and gopis developed the culture of Krishna bhakti. Of course, that's a slightly different translation than you find. This is um, Jiva Goswami's rendering, a little different than you'll find in the BBT. Again, he makes reference to this book, to this verse in Priti Sandarbha, so Priti Sandarbha is a text that describes the, the prema stage of bhakti, the topmost perfect stage. The parental affection is described as even greater than the affection of Krishna's coward friends, his sakas, because like Arjuna was Krishna's friend. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, bhaktosi me sakha Cheti, you're my, you're my devotee and my friend, and therefore you can understand what I'm going to explain, Bhagavad Gita. So his translation here matches his statement. Thereafter, O best of the bard says, the bhakti of Nanda, Yashoda, and all the coward men and women remained in its highest form, directed towards Krishna, who had become their son, who is longed for, but not attained by others. Bhakti here means prema. Their prema was completely, or nitaram, their prema was completely in the Lord because they had ascended to the highest level of affection, sneha, and loving attraction, raga. In this case, gopa refers to the cowherd men. Gopi refers to all the cowherd women except Krishna's beloved gopis, the young girls, to be in agreement with what will be said later. Paragraph. Among all, the great sages praise the gopis of Braja, and here's why. They have completely unequaled powers of controlling Krishna, Krishna by their priti. Now, priti is, a, priti is a common name for girls in India. And it has a nice meaning. Prema is another common name, but they're, they're similar but not identical. Priti is specifically the affection of love. And Prem is the stage of topmost love. There's the affection element. So the, the gopis have a special Priti or affection for Krishna which controls Krishna. And their Priti possesses particularly a wealth of Anurag and Mahabhava. These are all technical um, terms that you'll read about. I don't want to go into it too much. But in, in Nectar of Devotion, you started to do Bhakti Shastri study? Yes? No? At some point you will, most likely. And one of the texts is Bhagavad Gita, Nectar of Instruction, Ishopanishad and Nectar Devotion. And you'll learn about these teams, terms in Nectar Devotion. It's terms that Rupa Goswami uses, drawn from the, the Sanskrit texts, to describe stages and features and aspects of relationships. With every relationship, there's some affection and, and so forth. And you know, in higher stages of affection in relation to Krishna, there's raga and anuraga, and bhava and mahabhava. Like when Radharani, this mahabhava term is used, when, when Uddhava came to give the, the message from Krishna to the gopis, read a letter, I'll be back soon. I have to, I, you, I, you might, it said so many nice things. So when Uddhava was reading the letter, Radharani was off in a distance talking to a bumblebee like a mad lady, in madness of love for Krishna. She was scolding the bumblebee. You know this pastime? You have you heard of it. 
It's Radharani's talks with the bumblebee. She's in this mad state of love for Krishna, and she's scolding the bumblebee. You're the unreliable servant of an unreliable message. Get out of here. No, well, Uddhava's over there with the gopis, her friends. So he is the unreliable messenger of the unreliable master, Krishna. So and he says, she says many bad things about Krishna. And then the bumblebee disappears. And then she goes mad again. Oh, no, don't take that message to Krishna. I know who he is, but my affection, I, 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 it's okay. <laughs> Knowing who he is, I, I love him nonetheless. And, you know, please don't take that message to him. She's having this conversation with the bumblebee. In her state, so it's described, this is the stage of Mahabhava. There's bhava means spiritual emotion. I mean, bhava can mean material emotion too, but in the spiritual realm, it's a spiritual emotion. It's the stage of bhakti. The bhava stage and then the prema stage. And hers is Mahabhava. So the, the gopi friends of Krishna, of Radha, they also have it. They're expansions of her. So their affection, preeti, is nourished or nourishes excellent raga, mana, pranaya, and prema. This sequence is seen in the order that Uddhava took permission to leave. That is, when it was time for Uddhava, he had delivered his message and it was time to go back, he took permission. First from the gopis, there's the verse, I'll read it, and then from Nandan Jasoda, and then everybody. Because as far as he's concerned, the gopis are way up there. I mean, before he went to Braja, he went first to see Nanda Jasoda because there's the, the king and the queen. But after he saw the love of the gopis, they're way up there, spiritually. Then Nanda Jasoda, he then bade farewell to all the coward men and about to depart, he mounted his chariot. This is now another section from Preeti Sandarbha, the whole verses quoted, where he writes, in this verse the word bhakti means love, nitaram means up to the level of sneha and raga, gopa means all the gopi, all the gopas, excuse me, gopa means all the gopas, and gopiya means the gopis who are not Lord Krishna's beloveds. That means the elder gopis. Of all these devotees, the gopis of Raja who have the most glorious prema, pranaya, mana, and raga, love for Krishna, and who have the greatest good fortune of having anuraga and mahabhav love for the Lord, and whose pure love brings Lord Krishna under their control, are very glorious and fortunate. Their glory and good fortune have no equal or better. This is Jiva Goswami writing. It is, it is it's, he's giving scriptural basis for what Lord Chaitanya taught by both his words and his actions. The love of the residents of Vrindavan are the most exalted. And amongst the residents of Vrindavan, the most exalted are the gopis. And this is reasons why. And so Jiva Goswami is giving the reasons why. The scriptural basis for what Lord Chaitanya said. Gopi bhartur padakamala yor dasa dasa no dasa. He was giving a description of the identity of the soul. Not just, I'm a humber masmi. That's true. And not just um, that I am, as a spirit soul, I'm 
part and parcel of the Supreme. This is Bhagavad Gita. Mami Vangsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, the Jiva is the Angsa. Angsa means fragmental part, like a spark to a fire. Fragmental part of the Supreme, and the part is meant to serve the whole, so that's who I am. I'm Nitya Krishna Das, the eternal servant of Krishna, but even more specifically, I'm the servant of the gopis because the gopis are most exalted. That's Lord Chaitanya's teachings, and here's he's giving. I mean, it's, it's hard to do it thoroughly, but there's a reference from this particular text 51 verse stating in the Bhagavatam, the gopis are in this highest position as far as Uddhava is concerned. There's a little, there's a nice, outside of Vrindavan, Uddhava was considered the most intimately associated with Krishna. Arjuna was his dear most friend, but Uddhava gave him counsel. When it came to decisions, of course it's pastime, Krishna doesn't need anybody's advice, but he would take advice from Uddhava, and whatever Uddhava said, that's what he would do. There's a pastime in Dwarka where <clears throat> um, there was an invitation from Yudhisthir to perform the Rajasuya Yagya. And right at the same time as that invitation came, somebody else came and said, Jarasandha is making turmoil. Because, you know, Krishna had run from the battlefield and went to Dwarka. Jarasandha is making turmoil. Please, do something, help. So what did Krishna do? He turned to Uddhava. said, Uddhava, what do you recommend? Should I do this or that? You know, we think, come up in life, we have to make decisions. Do we go left or right? So Uddhava said, the Rajasuya should be done when there's no opposing personalities. Jarasandha is an opposing personality, so that should be dealt with first. And then the Rajasuya. Krishna accepted. So then they made a plan how to do away with Jarasandha. And you know the plan, right? They just, Jarasandha was known to be charitable to brahmanas. So he, Krishna, and Arjuna and Bhima dressed themselves up like brahmanas big shoulders and massive arms and powerful, you know, torsos wearing the attire of a brahmana. Jarasandha looked at them and saying, hmm, <laughs> these are chatriyas in disguise of a brahmana, but that's okay, they're coming as brahmanas, I'll give them whatever charity they want. So they did away with Jarasandha. So Uddhava's position was he would... Krishna would do it whatever he suggested. Very wise. Outside of Vrindavan, the wisest. So Krishna is sitting in Mathura. This is after killing Kamsa. He, then he told us, and Ugrasena becomes the king again. Lets him out of jail. He sits on the throne, installed as the king. It was time for Krishna to go back to Vrindavan. He told his father, Nanda, you go back, please tell the resident of Vrindavan, I have to oblige our relatives here. And after some time, then I'll come back. Surely I'll come back. So please carry that message. So Nanda brought the message, and everyone said, how could you leave without bringing Krishna? So Krishna's in Mathura, thinking, if I go back to Vrindavan, then the remaining demoniac kings on the planet, they'll know of my affection for the resident of Vrindavan, and they'll come and harass the Vrindavan folks. So I can't do that. What to do? And as he was pondering, Uddhava came to attend to Krishna's needs. He said, you're the one. You take a message to the resident of Vrindavan saying, surely I'll come. 
And that's how that. So he's 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 very intimate. But Krishna wanted Uddhava to just see the love of the residents of Vrindavan is so super excellent. His conclusion, Uddhava's conclusion is, I just want the dust from their feet. But it, if I ask them from the dust from their feet, they'll be too embarrassed. So I'll just undergo austerities so in my next life I can be a blade of grass and they can dust can fly in the air and land on my grass body and I'll be decorated with the dust of the, the gopis of Vrindavan. Have you been to Vrindavan? One day may you go to Vrindavan. And when you go to Vrindavan, I hope you too get to go too, you'll go to Govardhan Hill for sure. Right? That's your favorite pastime. So when you go around Govardhan Hill, Govardhan Hill is really long and it's narrow. To walk around Govardhan Hill takes about six hours or more depending on how fast you are. And when you go, you go down the east side and then hit, hit the bottom and come back up the west side, when you get towards the top, not so far from Radha Kun Shamakun, that's at the very top, the northern top, because it's long and narrow. There's a Uddhava Kund, where it's said Uddhava resides there as a blade of grass, because that's where he took birth, and there's a whole long story connected with it, which we don't have time for tonight. But when you go to Govardhan, ask them, and they'll tell you this nice story. Uddhava's there. It's a very nice story. So he knows the exalted nature of the residents of Vrindavan and especially the gopis. So now we're ready for the last verse of the chapter, which is 10.8.52. The BBT translation reads, Thus, the Supreme Personality Krishna, along with Balaram, lived in Brajabhumi Vrindavan just to substantiate the benediction of Brahma. I'm going to spend some time on that, the benediction of Brahma. By exhibiting different pastimes in his childhood, he increased the transcendental pleasure of Nanda, and the other inhabitants of Vrindavan. There's no BBT purport, but here's the commentary of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. And in order to fulfill the order of Brahma, quote, let there be Parama Bhakti through his pastimes, Krishna, along with Balaram, produced Prema, in the hearts of Nanda and Yashoda. So they were already nourished with natural love for Krishna like that, and the pastimes increased, expanded that love that they felt. Um, so what is this benediction of Brahma about? We're going to hear some more about it. Is everything okay? Okay, good. So there's there I, I did a bunch of research before this afternoon. Where is this benediction of Brahma anyways? So later it's gonna say Krishna doesn't need a benediction. But he upholds the word of his devotee, like he upheld the word of Nar Narada when the two trees now the Kuvera and Madhugriva became trees in the courtyard of Nanda, so Krishna delivered them to uphold the word of Nanda, Narada. Or in the appearance of Lord Shingadev, 
Lord Ishingadev upheld the words of Brahma that Hiranyakashi couldn't be killed this way, that way, the other way, the other way, the other way, the other way. So he he appeared to uphold the word of Brahma because Krishna likes doing that. So Brahma made a, before Krishna appeared, made some kind of benediction, a blessing that the Lord will perform wonderful loving pastimes. So Krishna did it to uphold the word of Brahma. So there's two places I searched. There's two places where it might ha have come from, but I couldn't find it this afternoon. And in, in Canto 2 of the Bhagavatam, chapter 7, Brahma's having a conversation with Narada. And Narada is a direct son of Brahma. So this is before Krishna appeared, before all kinds of things happened. And Brahma is giving a description of Krishna's pastimes before they happen. Here's the Prabhupada's purport, 2.7.33, 2.7.33. The first part of the purport reads, We should carefully note that the statements described herein are the statements of Brahmaji to Narada, and he was speaking to Narada of events that would happen in the future during the advent of Lord Krishna. The pastimes of the Lord are known to the experts who are cap able to see past, present, and future. And Brahmaji, being one of them, foretold what would happen in the future. 2.7.33. What would happen in the future? So he's giving this pronouncement of what would happen in the future if Krishna would perform wonderful, loving pastimes. So Krishna not only appeared at the son of Nanda and Jasoda because of their love for him, but he continued to have pastimes to fulfill the benediction of Brahma. He was doing many things, but that's one of the many things. Then there's another possible section, and that is, you won't be able to look this one up, but it's Canto 10, Chapter 2. And chapter 2 of Canto 10 is the prayers of the demigods to Krishna within the womb. So Devaki is in the prison house, and it's the eighth child, and there's these voices she's hearing in the prison house, and it's the demigods offering prayers to Krishna within her womb. And one of the persons offering prayers, well, Brahma and Shiva and other demigods. But Brahma is offering, perhaps, a prayer like this. He will perform wonderful, loving pastimes, increasing bhakti for all the, the people. So those are two before Krishna's appearance benedictions or utterances. I couldn't find the exact utterance, but it's referred to. It's referred to again later. Jiva goes, we're almost done. Jiva Goswami writes, Shukadeva Goswami concludes this section from the point of view of the, quote, apparent truth concerning Nanda and Yashoda's good fortune. The apparent truth means that they became his parents. But God doesn't have parents. Since Krishna is completely independent as Swami Bhagavan, to make true the benediction given by Brahma, who is the guru for all the Lord's devotees in the universe, the bhakti of Nanda and Yashoda expressing the highest desires should appear in this manner from the ordinary perspective. I mean, we're the ordinary people looking at Krishna appeared as the son of Nanda Dasoda, but he, he's nobody's son. He's the source of everything but he's upholding the word of Brahma. He then appeared as their son in Braja with Balaram, who was his greatest assistant in his pleasure to produce fame in the universe by not wavering from his obligation to Brahma. He lived there and produced bliss for Nanda, Yashoda, and their associates by pastimes intrinsic to his nature. This is the meaning 
according to the facts presented in this chapter. And that's the end of this evening's class. It's the end of chapter 8. And then we're not going to go on to chapter 9, because I want to save that for Kartik month. The Dhammadar Lila, because it's filled with glorification of Krishna's loving dealings with Nanda Maharaj in, in so many different, different ways. So the, the essence here is the unique love in, in attainment of, of all religions teach love of God. The essence is love of God. And the shape of that love of God is not described like this in any other scripture that I'm aware of. I mean, so many things to say about that. What does he look like? What's it like there? Actually, the last time I was visiting, um, it came as a recommendation to have some description from the scriptures of the kingdom of God. And so we started. I, you know, I shared when I was your age. I used to ask, "What's it like there?" When you go to heaven, I know it's just heaven. There was no distinction between heaven and the kingdom of God. Just like, what's the travel advertisement? And, you know, nobody could say anything. So it wasn't until much later when I read Prabhupada's books in the Bhagavatam, the, the clarity of the difference between Svarga and Vaikuntha. It's very clear in the Vedas. There's no such clarity anywhere else that I'm aware of. Heaven, Svargaloka, that all religions teach. And it kind of like merges into, you know, the kingdom of heaven and heaven. The kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Like one thing. Not one thing. Heaven is created and destroyed. Everyone that goes there, they, they take birth and they die. And the, in the kingdom of God, there's no birth and death. It's a very, it's like, anyway. And then, so, Vaikuntha. So we, when the Kumaras visit the gates of Vaikuntha, we hear about Vaikuntha. And they, you know, what's it like there? And then we hear Gopa Kumar, and he not only went to the gates of Vaikuntha, but he entered Vaikuntha. And he met Lord Narayan. <clears throat> the description of the, the personalities and the opulence and the everything and everything, the details are there. And then he goes from there to Ayodhya. And he goes from Ayodhya to Dwarka. Then he goes from Dwarka to Hastinapur. In Hastinapur, he goes to um, Vrindavan. Anyway, there are different qu qualities of uh, loving exchange in the kingdom of God. And the Bhagavatam wants us to understand that this particular realm of Vrindavan and the residents that are living in Vrindavan, their love is super excellent. That's what chapter 8 is describing, particularly from the parental affection side. Particularly. So let's see, we've already gone for an hour, but lots of nice stories. Maybe you'll be inspired to read Krishna book, find out more about Krishna's wonderful, attractive pastimes. So let's see if there's some discussion. We'll do a discussion in the room and then some online questions if there are any. Our host and hostess and our the two kids. Any questions, or should we just go to the online questions? Okay, online questions.
Krishna upholds the word of his devotees in such a sweet reciprocation to their love for him. It also strikes to me as especially beautiful because there is trust here where the devotees won't take undue advantage of his aspect of Krishna's love. My understanding is that the pure devotees are the ones who hold this ability because even they want to protect Krishna, so they are careful of their words. At the same time, we see that pure devotees like Lord Brahma, Shiva and other demigods are bound to give benedictions to those who fulfill their austerities. How do we reconcile the two? Well, um, it, it takes fine intelligence to reconcile the two. <laughs> and can you turn the speaker a little bit Mike, towards me? Thank, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, These exalted personalities that are capable of giving benediction um, their their consciousness is not just they're they're powerful but they also have a compass they have a spiritual or you know spiritual compass the pleasure of Krishna compass and so they may give benedictions that don't look so good like Brahma giving benediction to Rani Kashipu that he can't be killed this way, that way, the other way. And based on that benediction, it emboldened Rani Kashipu to do horrible things. Horrible things. Horrible things. So one might wonder, not only that, how can Brahma give a benediction that emboldens him to do horrible things, how can God let him do horrible things? How can God, who is the supreme, powerful, all-good personality, create a, a world in which horrible things people do? And people do horrible things. Not only Hirani Kashipu things, but you know, in modern times, people do horrible things. And it's not just modern times. Throughout all the history, people do horrible things without naming names, but, you know, people do horrible things that affect the lives of a lot of people, horrible things. So, why? He's all good, absolute, or why does he give powers to his great devotees that give benedictions that may result in horrible things? Ultimately, he's the supreme controller, and he, he finished Hirani Kashipu, Because, you know, it, 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 so it, it, the, the bigger question is why creation? And then within creation, why is there bad things? And why are there powerful persons that sanction because people do austerities and then, then with those sanctions they do bad things? It's all part of, you know, why do bad things happen? Why creation? Because living entities have desire and the Supreme Lord does not take away that option of free will to choose wisely or, wisely or foolishly or mercifully or the opposite, cruelly. He doesn't take away free will. So if people exercise their free will in the wrong way, there has to be a way that that can live itself out. And then at the same time, there's consequences for that. But his, his, the mercy of the Supreme Lord, and especially with his devotees, you know, Narada is very prudent about the benedictions he gives, or the, you know, whatever he does. And then Brahma has a different function, and Shiva has a different function. 
within the totality of this creation, this universe. So they, they act according to their nature. And ultimately, the Supreme Lord is the rest of whatever they do, and even whatever bad people do, and there's consequences for what those bad people do. The overall picture is, the overall picture is, the, the purpose of creation is to teach us a, a very fundamental lesson. It's not a good idea to try to be a separate enjoyer, austerities or not. It's a lose. It's it's a, it's a big mistake. The material world is the product of our misuse of free will. It's there because we want to enjoy separately from Krishna, which is a big mistake. The, the lesson is is there in so many ways to teach us. And then the alternative is also provided. What's the what's the proper use of free will? And so there's there's ample opportunity. Just people are facing the other direction. In real simple language, Prabhupada would say like this, when you turn your face towards the sun, what do you see? You see light. When you turn your back to the sun, what do you see? You see shadow. The material world is a shadow of the real spiritual world. So in this shadow place, dark things happen. And even powerful persons, they... If they give a benediction that turns it to be another bad thing, because they gave it, then the Supreme Lord corrects it personally. And when Brahma gives his benediction, that wonderful pastimes will be there that will attract the hearts and the minds of the conditioned souls for when Krishna appears in this world. Krishna opposed that too. <laughs> It all comes back to the, the source of everything. The absolute truth is the source of everything. And the source of everything is merciful. Krishna is merciful. Even when there's creation and even when benedictions. So the benedictions get turned around into something merciful by Krishna's arrangement. While not at the same time not, not interfering with free will. And it takes, so back to what I said at the very beginning, it takes some refined intelligence to understand all that. Otherwise, it's not fair. The rationalist will say. Powerful personality should only, should only give good benedictions. But not everybody wants a good benediction. So what do you do then? They're representing the Supreme Lord who doesn't interfere with free will. Everything's resting upon the, the source of everything. And acknowledging that is the purpose of our human life, at least. And it's a lesson that's not easily learned because we're heading away from the light and toward darkness toward shadow. Next one is in connection with this question from Kanagaraj Prabhu and his son. Their question is, sometimes it even looks that Narada Muni gives benedictions to the demons and uh, he he's a pure devotee but he's giving benedictions to the demons. No, he doesn't do that. Brahma sometimes does, and Shiva sometimes does, but Narada doesn't. What's the example of Narada giving a benediction to a demon? Um, they have, they watched movies. Uh, they watched a movie, okay. It's Sushupal and Bhakta Prahlad. I don't know which is. I don't either. Yeah. Go ahead. This is this, whoever this devotee is can ask the question offline because I'd like to check the source before commenting about Narada giving benedictions to demons. 
this amara mata ji shri uddhava saw the devotion of gopis and he desires to become a blade of grass in vrindavan to receive the dust of the lotus feet what had inspired lord brahma to ask for similar benediction um he experienced vrindavan and he was overwhelmed with what he has had that experience he saw they were so fortunate he's intelligent he's 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 the most intelligent being in the universe and he could see very quickly how fortunate they are and so that was what inspired him okay anything okay thank you very much prabhu pad ki jai do your children like to read they're very quiet and reserved so i don't